Thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. We are with Edward Graham, grandson of Billy Graham, Chief Operating Officer of Samaritan's Purse. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate this opportunity. I mean, it's a real pleasure given this is your first trip to Australia. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome. It's great. It's taken me years to get here. I've tried, but it's great to finally be here. Yeah, and the legacy of your family is one a lot of people will be familiar with. Your grandfather, Billy, your, your father, Franklin, and now we get to meet you as well. Mm. That legacy, where exactly do you fit within the makeup <laughs> of the Graham family? Missionary, you know, evangelist and the like. What's, yeah. what's sort of your story there? Well, there, well, there's 19 grandchildren. And so I fall in the line. I'm from my father, Franklin. I'm his third son. I got a little sister named Sissy. Um, but I'm the one that didn't do ministry straight out of school. I always, I'm the kid that lived his dream. I wanted to go into military. Uh, I went into our small special operations unit, went to our military academy that we here called West Point. So I made a career out of the Army. Loved it. My grandparents were excited for me. My grandfather was supportive of me. Actually, I could never tell my family where I was deploying to. Hmm. But later in my grandfather's life, when his health wasn't good, he had a map in his office, in his bedroom, actually. And I'd go and put a thumbtack where I was deploying to. So if my mom or my wife wanted to know where I was going in the world, just mm. go look. We called him Daddy Bill. Go look yeah. at Daddy Bill's wall. But the, he'd put his hand on that map every day and pray for me. Wow. Or, and he had a, with that thumbtack, he had a photo of me in uniform. And so he was always praying for me during mm. my deployments. Was it strange to, in some sense, it sounds like you're kind of breaking away from the family business. Mm. Did it feel that way to you? No, and I, maybe I'm the closest thing to a rebel in the family. Uh, no, I never re rebelled in that way. Um, I just, God called me to that, and that was a calling, and it's a great calling. Um, and God, I know, used me there, but at some point, He began to shift my heart. But I was part of ministry there, too. It's just mm. different. Um, I can't go and share my faith in front of a formation, um, necessarily. We have rules against that in our military. I know the Australian, probably military, would look down on that. But when a guy knocked on the door... And said, hey, sir, can we talk? My wife's leaving me. Hmm. Hey, sir, I know I'm drinking too much. And so when they knock at your door, you earn the right for the conversation. Then I can share my faith. Then that's a personal conversation. And yes, I'm still their commander, but I'm allowed to share my faith with them. And so God used me during that time. And then he slowly, I would say slowly, it was pretty quick and abrupt, but he changed my heart and I left pretty fast. What was the trigger for that change of heart? Uh, to be honest, when my grandfather passed away, um, there was the U.S. government honored him in our national rotunda, the Capitol. And when I was in there, we, shake, we shook hands for hours, uh, people coming through line. I mean, there was thousands of people coming through there. And afterwards, I went downstairs. And of course, Dad's going to be tired mm. at during that whole week. Um, but he looked exhausted. And for the first time, and I hate saying this, but I realized in my mind, I was like, all right, dad's getting older. And I just, am I, what am I doing to help serve him and to serve the ministry? And that's what got me thinking. Then one night I was watching an operation. I was what they call the chief of operations at our Joint Special Operations Command. Um, and so I was doing an exercise in Europe, uh, running that. And then on the screen, I was watching a mission in Afghanistan. Hmm. And it's a building, a house that I've been in twice before once. They captured uh, the father, and then years later, we went after the son, and he did not come peacefully. I've been in that house twice before, and now we're going a third time Wow! and going after one of the other sons. And I realized this just doesn't end. Hmm. Dad had asked me for years to come help him. I always said no. I was where God had called me. I actually told him, stop asking me. Yeah. <laughs> and he honored that. He stopped asking me the last time we talked. And But his proxies always, he had board members yeah. and family friends always ask the me. The subtle hints. That's right. But uh, I went outside and I called him. I was like, Dad, let's finish that conversation we had four years ago. And we were in Alaska, a ministry we had there when we had our last had the conversation. I told him not to ask me anymore. Hmm. So that night we talked and I said I'd get out. And so wow. I, it took some more timing. Dad said, stay to retirement, stay four more years. I didn't sleep. And my brother Roy, he's the one that told me, Edward, the disciples left their nets in the water and they followed Jesus. Hmm. We don't retire. It'll figure itself out. God's calling you to the ministry. And so I left. Wow. The immediacy of that making such a significant shift. Do you feel like the immediacy is important? Like when we feel something pressing on our heart, yeah. we've got to do it now? Well, I always told people, like, were you ever afraid in combat? And when you're in the palm of God's hand and the will that he's had for your life, there's no safer place to be. Plus, I was surrounded by a bunch of angry rangers, and they're very mm. good shots. So there is no safer place <laughs> to be. But when God had moved his hand and mm. taken me in a different direction for me, if I'd stayed in the military, I was no longer safe. 
Right. And I wasn't out of fear, but I knew in my heart because I was scared to death. The other thing I read, reading the scripture when we talk about uh, Peter walking on water, we always read that story, I think, in an elementary kind of way that, what was Peter? He took his eyes off Jesus and he sank. I know how humans are. I'm not going to add to this story because that would be blasphemy, but I guarantee later that night sitting around the fire, all the other disciples were looking at Peter with jealous. Mm. You know, they were jealous because he walked on water. So I realized if you want to be a part of a miracle in life, you get a, you have to be uncomfortable. You have to get yeah. out of the boat. And I was comfortable in the military. And you may think that sounds crazy doing special operations. But, I do, yes. But <laughs> I was surrounded by talent, and mm -hmm. it was my calling in life. And I realized I was no longer challenging. It was easy. Mm. Getting promoted, getting these positions of authority, it was easy to me. Not because I was some talented guy in the military. I was surrounded by talent, and I learned mm -hmm. how to listen. And I learned how to lead. Mm. And I just realized, oh, the ministry scared me. Mm. And Samaritan's Purse scared me. And I ran towards it. Yeah, yeah. And in doing military, it's like you're using your, your natural skills, the things that come as part of your calling. Mm -hmm. So it would have felt smoother than something that was a real shift. Yeah, it's actually been a pretty good transition for me. I mean, I've learned a lot and I'm still learning. But there's a lot of things that are very familiar to me. So... In the military, I was in a special operations mini, uh, mi uh, mission unit where you could get blown out within a couple hours. Like we had, we took turns, but you really had a 30 minute recall that you had to be back into your headquarters, getting your gear and going out the door. And it's a weird feeling when you're getting your equipment and you're rolling out. Mm. Um, and now when there's a disaster around the world, it's actually very similar. We have teams on call, ready to go. We can load up our cargo aircraft, our, our plane that we have there in the US and we can have a hospital anywhere in the world within about 36 hours. Yeah. A lot of that seems very similar and familiar. Mm. It's all about logistics, planning, relationships with people, with relationships with the church, um, going in boldly, knowing that you've trained and prepared and that God's going to go before. It's really not any different. Mm. So I, I enjoy it. It's a lot of fun. I miss my guys from my previous life. I thought I would never be surrounded by talent like that again. Oh, God proved me wrong quick. He humbled mm. me. There's so much talent in the ministry. And I, I call it slumming for Jesus. There's so many people that you'll meet out there that could be making a great fortune in the regular world, in the business mm. world, but they feel called to ministry, and that's where God's brought them. Mm. And in the similarity between the two, I feel like in one context, when you're getting ready and you're going out, there's, I would assume, a level of like there's, there's fear and there's fight in that. Mm. When you translate that into the world of Samaritan's Purse, you're going to rescue support. And in some respects, I would assume there is a bit of fight because it can be disaster situations. There can be a lot going on. Right. Is that a distinction that you feel between like a fear and a fight and a, and a rescue and a support mentality? Well, I look at it um, kind of this way. Bob Pierce is the man that founded Samaritan's Purse. He originally was the founder of World Vision. A lot of people know of World Vision. He left it and he believed he didn't want to take grants. He wanted to be built off the widow's might. But he always said two things. I didn't know him. He died before. He died of cancer before I was born, and he had asked my dad to take over. Um, and it was a it was an organization of four employees. Then it was Bob Pearson for. And then when Dad took over, it was in Hollywood, California. Dad didn't want to raise a family in Hollywood. Moved it to the mountains of North Carolina, so the four secretaries quit. So when Dad <laughs> took over, it was an organization of one. Oh, wow. Um, but he always said, "Let your heart be broken and pierced by the things that break the heart of Jesus Christ." The other thing that he was well known for for saying is living in God room. Plan so big and so bold that it will fail if God doesn't get all the credit and the glory. That mm. if man does it, it's going to fail. God has to show up and take it over the goal line. So when we respond during a crisis like this, we go in with big goals, big plans. But we plan. We've resourced. We take prudent risk. Because remember, we're built yeah. off the widow's might. I don't want to be frivolous with the widow's might and how we're responding. But there's people hurting in the world. God expects us to go now. It's now yeah. that we respond. And so is there a sense of like a rescue mission? Yeah, because that's what the gospel is. Like, you know, Jesus Christ came to this earth to rescue us and to save us from sin. And I want the whole world to know that Jesus loves them, that mm. Jesus has not forsaken them, has not forgotten about them. He died on a cross, and that is the most precious gift. So just like in the military, if someone was innocent and I wanted to go rescue them and, and, and bring them from harm, it's no different. I want it. It's actually, it, I'll tell you what, it is different <laughs> because this is life and death. What, you know, what happens, we think in the military, I always tell people, you know, there's evil out there. Mm. And I'm glad there's great men and women in our military. Like I said, I've worked with your SAS. You've got some incredible 
military members in Australia. I yeah. love the Australian Armed Forces. We've had a great relationship, and I've been with them on the battlefield. Um, like I said, I got one guy in particular from SES I love. He's probably really cheeky. I yeah, imagine you know, he's, he's got some like He's got a great cheek. sense of humor and yeah. uh, attitude. But, you know, I always talked about death isn't the solution, you know, to, to evil. You know, we all die. What comes after death is permanent. That's what's eternity. That's what, mm -hmm. and that's the decision I want people to understand. Where are you going to spend eternity? And I had to learn to love my enemy or it would have eaten me up. Yeah. Um, and that's the hard thing because I'd see things that they do. It is, it is pure evil, especially what they were doing to children. But in my heart, I knew I had to love them. And I realized I've been equipped and given opportunities through my name. There, you know, being a gram and having this nose and chin, it can only <laughs> open the door so much. Um, but then what am I going to do with the opportunity God's given me in the mm. platform of Samaritan's Purse? And that's what I realized I had to leave. And mm. uh, maybe the doors were open for me somewhere else where I could do more for a kingdom that lasts forever. Mm. It is a big legacy that you've inherited, that you're part of. Is that something that has ever felt like a pressure, like you've got a responsibility to live up to it or not so much? No. Um, now, I grew up in a small town in the mountains of North Carolina. And so I was in a community where if I got in a fight, everybody, like my mom knew about it. Um, if I skipped school, my mama knew about it. Um, so you couldn't get away with much. Hmm. I was okay with that. I mean, I it's part of being in a small town anyways. Um, but I never, dad and mom never put pressure on me. And like I said, they supported my military career. Now, dad didn't like it later in life. He wanted me out. Hmm. Um, but they supported me. But my name is Edward Graham. My brother is William Franklin Graham the fourth. Wow. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> I would say he has more pressure. Absolutely. Now, he would say he never felt that way. He became a pastor, and now he helps run the uh, Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, and one day he'll probably run it. Hmm. He will never be Billy Graham. My dad was never Billy Graham, hmm. and my dad is different from my grandfather. My brother, Will, is more like my grandfather. He's more of a pastor's heart. He has the same personality as my grandfather. I'm a little bit more like my dad. Um, and so that's probably why Samaritan's Purse is a more natural fit for me. But I never struggled with the legacy. I never felt pressure to run mm. Samara's Purse, people always ask me in the military, are you going to go, are you going to follow your grandfather's footsteps? And mm. I always told them, no, I'm where God's called me. Yeah. But I think the best legacy my grandfather could ever give me is one day we were watching the news and he held up his Bible and he looked at me and goes, Edward, I don't understand every word of it, mm. but I accept by faith that every word of it's true. And then he went right back to watching TV. And at 14 wow. years old, I was like, okay, that's a weird, weird conversation. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. But later in life, I realized that's the best, best advice he could ever give me. Mm. So, you know, he could never give me his faith. That decision had to become my own. Mm. Um, my mom actually led me to Christ at a Billy Graham crusade in California. My brothers were teasing me that I was going to hell one day. We were playing a game. That's what brothers do. Aha, mm -hmm. you're going to hell. Yep. So I told mom to set them straight. <coughs> and she's like, you know what? You are going to hell. Wow. And I was like, thanks, mom. <laughs> yeah, you like, really appreciate that <laughs> yeah. support. But she's the one that explained the gospel to me at five years old, led me to Christ. Now I had to come and make that faith my own. And that really happened at West Point at our military academy. Um, but once I accepted Christ and started living for him, and that was truly, I know, at West Point, and my decision was to follow him. Hmm. Um, I think that's why I didn't struggle in combat. I've never struggled with PTSD. I learned there was things in life that are bigger than us. You have to learn to surrender that and put it at the foot of the cross. Hmm. And... Um, so my faith has always been since I was a young boy hmm. and my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Wow, it's remarkable. And to think of the work that you're doing now in Samaritan's Purse, you guys and your teams are going into some situations that really need help. Yeah. Right? I think uh, right now, Turkey and Syria, there's still thousands of people in a situation of rebuild. Mm -hmm. There's family members that have been lost. There's communities that are just entirely displaced. Yeah. Catch us up on what you're doing there and how your teams are working with those locals. Yeah, so Turkey, it's a difficult place. We're a Christian organization. We make no qualms. We don't apologize about it. But Turkey has allowed us to come in there with a hospital. Um, these are hospitals that we can deploy anywhere in the world. We deployed them to Ukraine. That first week of the war, we had one in Ukraine. And then we were serving medically in other, in other ways in Ukraine, which we can talk about in a minute. But Turkey, we got the invitation to go in from the government. They have a government agency there that runs their responses during disaster relief. Um, but what you see on TV does not do it justice. Hmm. You're talking 10 cities, major cities. Uh, we're in Antakya, which is Antioch, ancient Antioch, where the wow. first church was. First time we ever heard the word Christian hmm. was in Antioch. And this is a city they say, the UN will say about 400,000. Um, 
I often think the UN's wrong, personally. I think they're wrong here. There's probably a million people crammed into this city. Mm. Um, it may be built for 400,000, but every building is either crumbs or it's so badly damaged just leaning over, they're going to bulldoze probably 90% of the downtown area. Yeah. Um, it is sad. It's devastating. And so we're set up in a, the old hospital there, which is a new modern looking building, but it's falling down. No one's in it. Mm. And we have a tent hospital set up. Um, that f I was there the first week of the earthquake. And you had four Australian team members, our dis disaster assistant response team, and they were nurses. They're serving boldly, and yeah. they were doing a great job, incredible job. And um, But it's amazing. We watched a lot of Syrian refugees come in because you're right there on the border. And so there were a lot of displaced Syrians there. And we had this woman that came in with a little boy, and he wasn't breathing well. Um, he was dying. I mean, his oxygen levels got down to like 40, and that is yeah. that's low. Um, and so we took turns holding him through the night to keep his, because he had to stay up a certain level. We had oxygen going and pumped into him. But I watched these nurses and doctors and even the, the, the build team, as we call them, the people that set up the tents and the construction guys, they were in there mm -hmm. all taking turns to love this child to get it back up to where it could be stable to be airlifted. Um, but it, the mother came up to me, and in this culture, it's very in the Syrian culture, her husband's not there with her. They're back with the, with the other kids, and she comes up crying and squeezes me. And I've been in the Middle East most of my adult life. That is not normal. Yeah. And she just, through the interpreter, was saying, thank you, thank you. No one else would love my child. Wow. And uh, y'all are here to love my child. And am I going to be able to share the gospel there in the Muslim world openly? No. Um, but the expectation, the calling is that medicine is a magnet for the gospel. People are hurting. The name of Samaritan's Purse is we meet the people and their immediate needs. Um, where they are in the ditch. And so just like the story of the Good Samaritan, you meet the medical needs, you bandage, you give them water, give them transportation. But the most important part of that story is a debt was paid. Mm -hmm. The debt is the blood of Jesus Christ. And eventually we'll be able to share. And we, our doctors are prepared. We do share. We do we do pray. Um, we do have chaplains involved in the program there in the hospitals. But this is going to transition more beyond that. We've already begun uh, a few weeks ago, even when I was there, a shelter program. There's so many people that don't have homes hmm. that was being controlled at the government level. But the vice president of their disaster relief was struggling. A lot of people are having lung issues there right now because of the dust. He came in to get treated at our hospital and he saw what we could do with what we call wash, clean water. To have a hospital, it's power and water. Hmm. And we, we provide all that internally. And so he's like, can you do this at a mass scale and can you do shelter? And we're like, oh yeah. So the tents that they already, that the government was purchasing, we had the same stint and tents and storage hmm. back in the U.S. and our warehouses. So we loaded up aircraft, came forward. Now we're involved in the shelter program. Yeah. So to be a Christian organization involved in sheltering displaced people in Turkey is incredible. But that is a testament to the church and the church part. We're not registered there. Hmm. We're working through a local partner, a church partner called First Hope, and they're bold and they're on fire and they're tired. They've responded yeah. since the beginning. These are Turkish men and women that have responded since the start of the earthquake to love their neighbors. And it's a long-term, if you've been into the Muslim world, it is a long-term commitment. that You have to be friends with that that person. You have to mm -hmm. show them you love them. You have to serve them. And it's years later they'll ask a question, Jesus wasn't a prophet? Yeah. And that will get the conversation. So really we're an extension of the church there. We're just supporting them. So years down the road they'll remember it was a church that loved them. Same mm -hmm. thing in Ukraine. When this war is over, the Ukrainians will know that it was a church that housed and fed and clothed them. Yeah, and there'll be so many incredible stories to come yeah. from that, the one you just shared, and yeah. then so many others. And I wonder, though, how do you know when to leave these places? Yeah. Because they fall out of the headlines fairly quickly. <laughs> when do your teams get out? Yeah, so it has nothing to do with the headlines at Samaritan's Purse. Um, and that's true in our U.S. disaster, because we respond here in tornadoes and hurricanes. Uh, Last so it was a year ago at Christmas, a massive tornado destroyed a downtown city in Kentucky and just destroyed all of it. We're still there, sir. Everyone else is gone, but we're still building homes for the non-insured and underinsured families there, and putting them back into. And we're we're going to be there for another six to eight months as we finish these communities, building about a hundred homes in this community alone. Uh, and with the hospital there, we'll serve until the government of Turkey no longer needs us and they're able to get their feet back under them. I don't, they have a field hospital set up in, in Atakia, a Turkish one, but they're still overwhelmed and they're still mm -hmm. having tremors. Uh, yeah. Matter of fact, they had a 6.3 earthquake in Antakya. These other earthquakes were further north, 
But the day after I left, a 6.3 happened and it crumbled buildings on the rescuers. Mm. We treated 111 patients within that first hour. Wow. Um, so those are still happening. I don't know when we're going to leave there. Now, we're going to be a part of the shelter program there probably for months. But Turkey is 10 cities like this. Mm. They will never truly recover from this. So we will serve there as long as Turkey allows us and we have opportunity for ministry. And then we'll move. Samaritan's Purse has 20 different country offices around the world, like in Vietnam, um, Colombia, uh, South America. Um, and we're in Africa, South Sudan, and other countries where we work and do projects. Sometimes we'll, st- we'll set up a temporary country office, like in Ukraine. We've responded with what we call our disaster assistant response team, doing a disaster response. But then we'll have a country office form, and that's where we'll do rebuilding programming. Mm-hmm. It's hard to do rebuild. Well, war's still going on. Yeah. So I don't know how long we're going to be in Ukraine, but we're still doing there treating medically. We're still feeding. We're using our Operation Christmas Child Network, which is about 3,000 churches. They have been feeding eastern Ukraine all winter. Wow. We've been sending metric tons of food in each month hmm. to feed eastern Ukraine. It's not Samaritan's Purse feeding. We buy the food. We give it to our church partners. They're delivering it to the eastern front. They're delivering in areas where they're getting shelled. We're setting up water program, which is providing clean drinking water in the south where the Russians turned it off. We're providing shelter, warm shelters for those families that didn't leave and they were mm. bombed out. And we'll be there for years probably after yeah. this, helping rebuild churches and rebuild these communities once the war's over. It's a huge job to say the yeah. least, you know, and there's so many team members that are involved in really mm. executing what you guys are doing over there. When we talk about what it takes to be missional right yeah. to, to have the heart of someone that's going to go into countries like this and help or even in our own local context having a mission mindset in the way we go about things what do you think that looks like what is what is someone who is missional what is, what is their character yeah. like someone that is missional is obedient you'll have people like lord send me you know let me know if you're calling me to this and they will sit there and years later they're like well god never called me i believe christianity is of action Pray about it, figure out where God's calling you, and just start. If you're sitting there like, well, he hasn't made himself known, start doing something for the gospel. Start using, you're like, well, he hasn't, you know, I can't sing, so I can't do worship. I'm not a preacher, or I'm an introvert. I'm an introvert. People might not think that. My dad, Franklin's an introvert. Mm. Um, Get out of the boat. You got to be uncomfortable to be part of ministry. And ministry is one-on-one. You got to get dirty. Um, you got to be in there with them in the dirt, in the trenches. And that's that's part of being a leader too, I think. But sitting there and like, how can I get involved? You're never going to get anywhere mm. unless you start taking that, get that step out of the boat that I talked about. We we only talk about Peter today in that story because he's the only one that got out of the boat. Yeah, um, yeah he sank. You're going to mess up. You're going to fail. Mm. Just don't repeat your failures. All right, Peter, don't repeat your, don't take your eyes off Jesus again. Don't stumble. Um, learn from those lessons. And so that's my hope and prayer for people. How do I, how do you, how are you missional? Well, go. Yeah. Um, and then you'll be called to something or then it'll be like, oh, I can do this. Or there's a need there. Let me jump in on that. Mm. You won't know and if you're sitting at your couch back home praying about God speak to me. God, I think will speak to you when you're getting your feet moving. Yeah, there's something really proactive about it. Yeah. yeah. I, I want you on your knees praying. But then get on your feet and start walking. Well, Edward, it has been a privilege to talk yeah. with you, to hear some of your story. So thank you so much for joining us. No, well, thanks for this opportunity. Appreciate it. Thank you for your ministry here in Australia and what y'all do. I've been trying to get here for years, so it's awesome to finally be in Australia. We're glad to have you. Yeah. And uh, to everyone watching, thank you so much for watching. You can, of course, find more interviews just like this on the Hope 1032 YouTube channel. 